Welcome to the Robot Podcast. I'm Fran Scott, maker, demonstration developer, and massive engineering fan. Every week, my guests and I will be exploring the exciting stories of how robots can, will, and are impacting our everyday life. From sorting food to cleaning our hospitals, from manufacturing cars to creating sustainable buildings, robots are pushing the boundaries to meet the demands and challenges of a changing world. And as technology improves, it is becoming easier for robots to adapt and perform multiple tasks that, behind the scenes, offer huge societal benefits. It's all about flexibility and simplicity. Let's start with the year that was, 2020. It is very safe to say that 2020 was a rather different year and it affected individuals and businesses in varying degrees. But one thing that you may not know is that as the pandemic was sweeping across the world and humans couldn't go to work like normal, this meant the need for robots to carry out normally human allocated tasks absolutely skyrocketed. And during the pandemic, not only were robots able to provide continuity for businesses, but they also ensured the safety of the humans who could still go to work. What COVID-19 did was push the world of robotics to help maintain some level of normality, whilst at the same time adapting to a ridiculous amount of change. This week, we'll be exploring what the robotics industry learned from 2020 and what is in store for its future. Joining me are Dr. Sami Atia, president of ABB Robotics and Discrete Automation. Hello, Fran. Hello. And also we have Dr. Pippa Malgrim, robotics and automation entrepreneur and policy analyst. Hey, Fran. How are you? I am very well. And last but by no means least, we have Dr. Thomas Bonnet head of the Cyber Human Lab at the Institute for Manufacturing at Cambridge University. Hello, friend. Hello to all of you. Let's start at the beginning. Pippa, can you clarify what exactly do we mean when we say the word robot? You know, this term was originally introduced in around 1800 to mean something that propels itself. The word really comes from the idea of servitude something that's serving you. And it just covers such a wide range of things. The definition just keeps morphing and changing, but it's a lot of things. Uh, More and more, it's just anything that's automated to my mind. And Sammy, what are your thoughts on that? Well, according to the IFR, which is the International Federation of Robotics, uh, the definition is an automatically controlled, reprogrammable, multi-purpose manipulator. Catchy, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, isn't it just- but when I was working on my PhD about 25 years ago, we built a robot with vision and AI, and uh, and it's actually now in the Museum of Science and Technology in Munich. Uh, but since then, actually, since the last 30 years, the fundamentals have not really changed. There's some, you know, some changes that happened, like the computing power increase and the affordability of devices has really become much better. Costs went down. But today, robots are capable of of everything from lifting an entire car body to working safely in labs side by side with human uh, co-workers. They are used in uh, lab works, automated kiosks for dispensing mobile phones and other items, in making hot pots in China, and in sorting and packing everything from apples to potato chips in logistics centers around the world. And our robots are even on commercial fishing boats, cleaning and packing fish fillets. So with the ongoing development of software, making robots more programmable and easier to use, we see robots really have been deployed across many, many industries as we go. And Thomas, what what are your thoughts on all of this? Well, we've already heard, I think, very, very useful definitions of what robots are. But I find it particularly intriguing that even roboticists themselves cannot agree as to what a robot actually is. (laughs) The boundary between both I find particularly interesting because the boundary between what a robot is and what a robot not is, that boundary is sometimes blurred. And that is maybe where some of the most interesting developments are currently taking place. Yeah, and that is the mind of a an engineer when I ask what is a robot and you're like, well, what isn't a robot? <laughs> <laughs> so, let's look at the field with a bit of a, a wide-angled lens and 
Why are companies of, of all sizes turning to robots? Sammy, why do you think that is? Well, there are many areas why companies use use robots. Uh, I mean, it used to be very strongly, you know, productivity and quality. When you take a robot, it basically improves your, your output of whatever you want to produce. You want to produce cars or cell phones or what have you. So, but what we see is increasing demand for what we call flexibility and simplicity. Flexibility is becoming very important because the customers tell me, I need to be independent of variations. I need to be uh, flexible in my, my production. And the other one is, is simplicity. And there are mainly four key drivers for these demands. And the first one is personalization. So all of us want to have you know, the cell phone in the color we like, and we'd like to have it the next day in the morning and ship by us you know, immediately. And in, in some countries, like in China, you can get it in, a, in an hour or two. So this is really putting a huge demand on the whole supply chain for logistics and so on to be able to cope with. I click a button and I would like to have that product shipped to me in the color of my of my wish. And then the other one is aging population. For example, in China, in 2030, a quarter of all the population will be older than 65 which means that you will have to, if you want to continue the productivity of a nation like in China, you have to automate and you have to use robots. And the other big glue is digitalization, more and more connectivity we're seeing and, and driving uh, demand. And the last one, which is global uncertainty. And it, it didn't start with COVID. It actually was before there. You know, we have Brexit, we have, you know, trade challenges and so on. Obviously, with COVID, it added uncertainty. But when you talk to customers, our customers want to become independent of all these uncertainties and give them flexibility. For example, demand goes up, spikes. I need to be able to cope with that. But let's assume co uh, demand collapses, like, for example, any industries by 50%. I need to be able to be flexible and adapt my, my, uh, my capacities as well. So these four areas are really driving more and more robotization and, and automation as we go. Brilliant. And those four areas are the customization, aging population, digitalization, and global uncertainty. Exactly. And Thomas, have you got anything to add to that? Sammy is absolutely right. I think robots are part of technology progress. It is, I think, geared towards productivity to a large degree, as, as, as Sammy said, and it's embedded in the wider societal trends that we are seeing. But this, at the same time, I think it's important to keep in mind that technology in itself is progressing and that enables new opportunities. But I think we shouldn't underestimate how quickly technology is developing these days. And what are some of these progressions? Like, are there some things that are actual reality now that, say, like two years ago, we would have just thought of as sci-fi? An interesting example, the idea of having a warehouse in which all our groceries are basically packed by, by robots. That's, that's something I don't think many people would have envisioned not that long ago, but that's a complete reality and has been for a number of years already. In, in which countries? I had no idea this was a reality. Surprisingly enough, you might, you might have consumed it yourself. So if you use a company such as Ocado, they're using such facilities in the UK. Wow. So, so Pippa, why, why do you think there are many companies that are turning to using robots in their industries? It's just a way of making more things happen more easily. So, for example, everything from sanitizing hospital rooms, instead of sending a human in, especially in COVID, you send a robot and it toodles around and it will spray sanitizers and it will desanitize a space. But one of the things that concerns me about robotics is people have so much fear uh, mm -hmm. They're, you know, afraid that robots are going to steal their jobs, for example. But the first truly robotic instrument was introduced in 1804, and that was the Jacquard weaving loom, right? It was a textile manufacturing machine. And the term Luddite, which means somebody who hates robotics and hates automation, comes from that time because the Luddites attacked those weaving looms. But interestingly, not because they made the weavers more productive, but because the owners at the time used the introduction of robotics as an excuse to pay the workers less. If they had continued to pay the workers the same, 
but watch their productivity skyrocket, there would have been no need to attack the weaving looms. But because they said, okay, now you're able to produce, I don't know, 10 times as much, we're cutting your salary. And, but the reality is that since that time, since 1804, we've had nothing but more robotics and automation. And prior to COVID, as an economist, I looked around the world and what did I see? Record level employment everywhere from China to the U.S. So to my mind, automation and robotics do not equal unemployment at all. But most people have decided that they do. We did say we would talk about pandemic applications. And in 2020, there was, of course, so much uncertainty. But one thing that crops up again and again within the robotics world is the fact that when humans had to stay at home, it was robots that stepped in to keep industries afloat. I'd like to start with the same question for everyone. What do you think was the most interesting use of robotics during the pandemic? Sammy, let's start with you. Well, I'm, I'm very happy that we have many examples. I mean, one of them is, is in Singapore, the COVID testing, the national COVID testing. So 50,000, 50,000 is the number of corona tests that are possible in Singapore today per day based on, on robots. So we have about 50 robots do, is helping the authorities to do 100% of all tests uh, needed in Singapore just because of the, of the robot and autom automation. But I have another example, a company called Boyce Industries in New York and the CEO, Charles Boyce, uh, came to us and he said he wanted to do the right thing and uh, asked us if we can help him produce instead of computers to produce ventilators. And he was able to do that in a couple of weeks to produce 300 ventilators per day, thanks just to robotization. So that shows really how, how flexible, you know, a company can become using robots. Amazing. Thomas, what's your interesting use, according to you, of robotics in 2020 during the pandemic? So related to the ventilator challenge, we saw a lot of manufacturers in the UK retooling and reusing some of their resources to create different, much more needed products. And as part of that, people had to use completely different skills. And people were using, for example, augmented reality headsets to instruct people to do certain things remotely. And I think that is an interesting example of uh, maybe a, a blurring boundary as to what actually a robot is to some degree. Because, of course, we had to be so distanced that that's when AR would really come into its own with that virtual training. Yes. And Pippa, what's your most interesting use of robots in 2020? For me, it's about the fact that they teleport my sensory perception. That means I can sit here in London and push a button on my phone and have my eyes moved to the other side of the world. Now, that can happen just as we're doing right now on a Zoom call. And this is the reason that Zoom is now worth more than ExxonMobil, like one of the biggest oil companies in the world, because it teleports all of us to another location. And it is a robot, right? Because it's using machinery, whether it's your mobile phone or our desktop. That is a, that's a physical machine that is now allowing this extraordinary transformation from our physical atoms of reality into these electronic bits of information. So to me, that, that is a robotic process, uh, but it's not the one people usually think of. <laughs> yeah, but it's the one that affects a lot of people's lives every day. Sometimes it's geographical reasons that you can't get to a place, but there's a whole host of other reasons that it could be that you couldn't get to that place. And, and in a way, 2020 through this robotics has opened up the world to all manner of people. Completely. And uh, one of the things I've been involved in in 2020 is the production of drones and autonomous vehicles that you can have, for example, I can be here in London and say, I have a mining site in Brazil or an agribusiness in Africa, and I need to understand what's the actual situation there and prevent accidents that might have happened otherwise, because now I can really assess what is happening on the ground and see an accident building before it actually happens. This, again, is an uh, unbelievable development, and it'll make the world safer. 
it'll allow value to be created in remote locations in ways that could never happen before. So, Sammy, are there any other interesting trends that happened throughout 2020, do you think? Yes, one is certainly this staffing challenges where with our robots we're able to perform movements of picking samples and then moving them around. So we actually free up the people to do other type of work. And the other trend that we saw is this rapid scalability. In e-commerce, we saw a rapid growth of parcels that needed to be shipped. And there we worked with an AI company called Covariant. It's a US startup where using AI technologies to package and grip parcels, basically boxes and different sizes without ever seeing them before. And this is a new trend in robotics is you use AI, machine learning and other technologies to do things without teaching. And this will be the future of robotics as well. And the third trend is this increasing of productivity to a new way. For example, we work with a pharmacy in Sweden as well called Apotea, and they increase their productivity by 30% to be able to deliver 170,000 packages per week. So the workload on these pharmacies becomes so big that, you know, you have to automate. And back to, to what we've discussed before, it is supporting society in, in, a, in a situation like this. That is absolutely fascinating. And Pippa, what are your thoughts on um, the trends of 2020 and, and if there actually were new trends or if it just accelerated old trends? I think it definitely has accelerated. I totally agree with that. Humans are capable of extraordinary change. They are so adaptable. We took what should have taken 10 years to digitize and collapsed it really into about three months with extraordinary productivity results. I saw so many companies, so many institutions, if you had said to them in 2019, you're gonna have to do the following things and you're gonna have to do it in basically three months, everyone would have said that's impossible. But when faced with real circumstances and aided by automation and robotics, suddenly the impossible becomes possible. And that's a wonderful, magical thing. You know, Arthur C. Clarke famously said that no technology can be fully adopted until it has the characteristics of magic, that people feel it's <laughs> magical. And in a way, that is what's happened in 2020. We have magicked into being whole new ways of operating because of automation and robotics. And one last thing on this too is that Technology has massively democratized the access to the workplace. You know, people who previously were cut out because they couldn't get to an office because they had a disability or because they had responsibilities like parents that couldn't come in for fixed time frames. Suddenly now everyone can participate uh, in the workforce. And I think this is an amazing, positive development, the democratization of the access to the workforce itself. Completely, completely, if you have internet access. Yes. So, Pippa, you say that there's democratization of the workforce. And what does this mean for equality as a whole? And also in terms of leveling the playing field when it comes to large companies and small startups? I actually think this is hugely advantageous for the small startups. We had been in a world where you needed a big company to innovate, but that's not so true anymore. And actually you don't need that much capital anymore to either make robotics or to be in robotics or to deploy them. And I think that this is an amazing advance that really puts a lot of power into smaller enterprises and more people's hands. So if we do look back on 2020, obviously we look back on it with a, <laughs> a whole range of emotions. What can we learn from 2020 within the robotics world? I think many things will change and some things will remain. And if I want to zoom in more on the industrial side, I think what also many of our customers saw is that there is a huge 
societal benefit also for automation and robotics. And if you think about the future, what would I do if I run a business? Certainly the most important is business continuity. I need to make sure that my business will, will continue to run. And in times of crisis, and crisis could be many things, so with automation and robotization, you, you can become independent of these fluctuations. We have a tool called Robot Studio. We were able to design a whole factory line visually. Um, we've been able to do that quite a, a while ago. But now in the COVID times, it was, for example, customers who wanted to restart their business. We were able to model their factory line offline without touching anything, without even being on site, doing a whole modeling, and then download the software that we have actually modeled and it was a runtime software. So basically, it helped the customers without even putting a foot on the ground there, having one or two employees from the customer remotely connected to us and doing the whole simulation, you know, digitally. And if you, you Hang think on, about Sammy. That, you say this like <laughs> it's just you're like something you do every day. This is mind-blowing. So you've recreated a, a virtual twin of a factory and the systems that that factory uses. So you can basically remotely operate that factory without ever stepping foot within that factory. Yes, we can We can remotely model, but don't remotely operate because we leave the operation for the customer, but also for safety reasons, but we can model the factory offline. But the benefit now is becoming huge because Obviously, you don't have to travel is one, one big thing. And, and in the future, I'll tell you, I, I will see that we will have to travel uh, even, even less. For example, we can service you know, our robots, basically, if something broke, with virtual devices. We can see uh, what is going on there, help our service technicians on the, on the ground or even the customer. And we don't have to travel. So I think these two trends, business continuity, are important. And then the visual, virtualization of, of the world will become more and more a trend that we will see. So we've talked a lot about the different tasks that robots can do and how they've helped us as humans get through this pandemic. But what does this all mean for the future of the working world? Well, there's quite a lot of fear that robots will take our jobs, isn't there, Sammy? Well, I'm absolutely sure that robots create jobs rather than taking them. The countries that are more advanced in deploying robots, and I would just call out South Korea, Japan and Germany, there's something in the industry that is called the average use of robots. In these countries, we have an average of between 300 and 600 robots per 10,000 employees. Now, the average worldwide is 70, but the countries that use more robots have a much, much higher employment rate than the other countries. When the customer asks us to increase the automation of their facility, in most of the cases, they hire more people afterwards because they have more and more to do service, engineering, software, logistics, and, and what have you. So robots create jobs and create even better jobs. So this, this fear that people tend to have that a robot will take my job, well, initially, yes, they might, but should you be doing that job in the first place? Is it dangerous to you? Exactly. I mean, there are many tasks that we call the dull and the, and the dirty and the dangerous jobs, the three Ds. And these are the ones that in general robots are taking. But it's also the best performing manufacturers are actually the ones who harness the best out of humans and the best out of the machines. And the co-working will increase as we go. And I see that as a big trend in, in robotization. Pippa, do you, do you agree with what Sammy said? Oh, yeah. The way I think about it is what it does is it frees up human creativity uh, so you don't have to do something that's a mundane task. And it's too narrow to think of jobs. I mean, when Henry Ford introduced the automobile, most people wanted to know how do we get the horses to go faster? You know, that was the priority. And if you think about it, people would have been terrified about all the jobs that would be lost in the horse and buggy industry. And how many jobs have we created because of vehicles? I mean, it's the same. And this will just keep happening at ever greater scale. So the acceleration of the process of change is already something that challenges the imagination. And I think this is what robots and automation will do at an ever faster pace. 
Thomas, have you got anything to add? Well, I think we have to think about this more broadly than just full automation or no automation. There's a huge space between both of these extremes. And what I'm and my team in Cambridge are particularly interested in is how technology can actually augment human abilities in a meaningful way. And I think going forward and looking into the future, which was your question, Fran, I think what will be really interesting is how technology can be used to amplify human abilities and some of the co-working, cobot relationships. I think these are the things that are particularly interesting in, in shaping the, the future of work. So with that in mind, there are obviously challenges that we need to overcome for robots to become even more ingrained into our everyday life. So why do you think there is that fear or uncertainty around robotics? Well, I think there are probably many reasons. I mean, first, people are hesitant to use something initially if if they don't quite know how it behaves, what it can do. But once they realize it works, I think that fear will go away. Maybe on a more interesting note, There's a lot of research that looks into how should a robot actually look and what does it actually mean for our comfort zone as to how we interact with robots. And it's a fascinating subject. Yeah, one of the most fascinating things I've come across in robotics was uh, the use of robots to do things like demining in war zones, right, to go find hidden mines that would blow people up. And the soldiers, they started to put eyes, like paint eyes on those robots. They would start to really give them names. And then when they would get blown up, they would take them back to the manufacturer and say, could you please repair Sally? And the manufacturer's like, well, we'll just replace this thing. And they were, no, 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 this is Sally. Like, this is my robot. And she needs to be repaired, not replaced, because they've got now an emotional relationship with this machine that saved their lives. And I think this is so interesting is how humans start to connect and cathect with robots. And a big thing for people to use robots, I suppose, is making them reliable, making them work when you actually want them to work. But there are also other dimensions to using robots, isn't there, Thomas? Uh, Absolutely. No doubt about that. So one dimension I would just like to mention is the the ethical dimension. And the relationship between robots and humans raises a a number of, I think, very interesting questions on who owns the data, who is accountable for the actions of these systems. And no doubt these will become ever more important in the future. But they're not insurmountable. These are just questions that need to be discussed and need to be discussed at a societal, political level. I think it's completely doable to figure out a mutually beneficial way going forward. Gosh, there's so much more to think about than you think when you start, of course. Yeah, especially with the co-working of robots. So to end, here's the big question. What do you think is the next big thing for robotics? Pippa. Oh, gosh, there are going to be so many things. I see things like, you know, the delivery of medicines to remote locations using flying robots, the capturing of data of the deep ocean using robots that swim, the ability to make things happen at an incredible speed. As Sammy said, you know, once you know how to make a ventilator, then you can make a lot of them incredibly quickly. And so it won't matter what is the problem that we face, we'll be able to create a robot that can address it. And so that's revolutionary. And you, Thomas, what what is the next big thing for robotics? If I was to pick one, I'm particularly interested in situations where you have teams of robots and teams of humans working together. And these are really interesting, really novel work situations in the future. And you, Sammy? Well, for me, the next big thing is is that we will see a whole new level of human productivity thanks to robots. The other one is using artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms that will enable new fields of um, of applications for robots. And last but not least, it's advances in complementary technologies like 3D printing, 5G, new sensors and vision system that when you add them to the the robot, it will also enhance the way robots are actually used. At the end of the day, I believe there will be new ways to produce in the future with humans and robots side by side. 
So the future is bright. And with that, unfortunately, that does bring us to the end for this week. But I want to just continue chatting to you all. A massive thank you to Dr. Sami Atiyah, Dr. Pippa Malgram and Dr. Thomas Bonnet. Next time, we'll be discussing our new robot sidekicks, collaborative robots or crowbots. Please drop us a review on Apple Podcasts and don't forget to subscribe to The Robot Podcast so you never miss an episode. I'm Fran Scott and this has been a Fresh Air production for ABB. Part of the ABB Decoded series. 